So that's, that's really where this was born, uh, is working with a lot of clients and a lot of colleagues. Uh, we encountered some differences in vocabulary, and really, words matter when we talk to each other, when we try to set each other's expectations. So that's why this presentation was born, but it was also born out of the need to try to set your expectations as to why user journey mapping is valuable. So that's what we're trying to do, is we're trying to improve a user's experience. And this applies to more than just websites. You, you think of websites, that's what we are at Unleashed Technologies. We're a digital agency, and we focus a lot on digital experience as well. So the confusion really comes from all of these different words that come up in user experience exercises, the things that we to, do to try to understand people, understand what they're trying to accomplish, understand their emotions, their thoughts, where they run into problems, and try to, well, rectify that. We want to improve design. Anytime that you have a great experience, whether it's at a hotel, jumping into an Uber, or just getting onto a website, usually that's not a mistake. Somebody put energy into that, and we want you to understand what energy you can put into improving things as well. So let's try to go around each one of these things and give some definition. So user experience research is imperfect. You're not looking for done. You're not looking for perfect. You're trying to find ways that you can grow. You're trying to create empathy, understanding different perspectives. I have my experience in life, and that's, I'm sure, different than yours. And if I'm making something for you, well, I can't just stay in my head in a vacuum and design something glorious that's going to make you feel like well, I thought of you, so that's very important. So we go through a few different exercises in user experience research, and sometimes they lead into one another, sometimes they're cyclical, sometimes they mature over time, and that's fine. So we'll talk about that a little bit. So what are user journeys? Why, what is this thing? So user journeys are what a person experiences when they go through any type of a process. Uh, we can all have different experiences. So, for example, buying a car online versus buying a car at a dealership. Yes, you can buy cars online now. This just blows my mind. But say, for example, my father, who just turned 71, wants to buy a car. He's just going to go to the dealership. He's not going to really look online. He's not really comfortable with that. That is his experience. He's a type of person, and I can try to characterize that type of person in, well, a persona. So that's his experience. My experience, I may do a little bit more online research because, well, I'm a technophile. That's kind of what I do. Uh, you can also take a look at things like the difference between a corporate member versus an individual member joining an association. So AUSA is a good example of this sort of thing. And we have some examples from uh, National Guard Association of the United States here as well. So we're really trying to focus on what are the motivations emotions, thoughts, touch points that a person experiences, feels, thinks, interacts with along the way, and how can we improve that experience? So perhaps I went to a website and it was just awful. I, I couldn't see the pictures, I couldn't get descriptions, that's a touch point. Maybe I had a conversation with a dealer, that's a touch point. Maybe I called somebody to try to schedule an appointment, that's a touch point. So that's what we mean, and I feel different things, and I think different things. These are all opportunities to make an improvement, well, if we can impact those things. So user journey mapping is an exercise that takes that user journey, what it is that individuals experience, and it tries to map it out. It gives us an exercise. So it's, again, to create empathy through a process from a specific perspective to gain insight about the areas of improvement. So, for example, making adjustments to a system or components in a conversion funnel. And what it is, is articulating that process and experience from the perspective of a specific user persona. So, for example, somebody that's a potential member versus an existing member, renewing or becoming a new member, that's going to be a different experience, and we want to focus on what their experience is to make improvements. So how do we do that? Well, we want to create or leverage applicable user personas um, by gathering real user feedback or mimicking through method acting 
uh, so that way we can empathize with that person. So I'm not my dad, <laughs> so I want to mimic him in a process of buying a car, for example. So I need to understand what is it that motivates him? What is his background? Why would he prefer going in person to a dealership versus going online? And that's a valid feeling, that's a valid motivation. And there are different points through a journey that we can try to dissect into three different phases. First, there's the awareness discovery phase. Then there is the interest and consideration phase. And then lastly is the evaluation or conversion phase. And we'll go over that again. So how does this relate to user personas? Again, it's, it's about who this is for, and we need to develop user per personas that are applicable to the thing that we're studying. So if I'm trying to develop something or improve something for a university, I don't really need to think about my dad and him buying a car. That <laughs> doesn't really apply to that. But if we're talking about someone that is a potential student, like a high school student that's in state, that's a persona. But we could also be talking about a high school student that is out of state. And while they mo both may be applying for a student loan, their experience is gonna be slightly different and we need to cater to those differences. So we can make these personas. Now, UX personas are a little bit different than marketing personas. So if you have a background in marketing, then you'll, you'll recognize what you've done there to, again, still create empathy and tr still try to have good messaging for that segment but you're trying to create more empathy to understand their experience, specifically interacting with whatever it is that they're interacting with, whether it's a website or just face-to-face. -face. So there's similarities, but there are also some differences in how we construct those, and we'll take a look at that. So really, whenever we try to do anything in these exercises, we're trying to think of the questions that we're trying to ask and then ask them to the appropriate people. So this can come in the form of user interviews, this can come in the form of surveys, this can come in the form of customer feedback logs. If you have a customer support department, this is a great asset and you wanna tap into that and interview them as well. In most cases, you wanna have a direct tie to the people that you're studying. If it's second hand, then it suffers a bit of that broken telephone sort of thing. So to develop these user personas, we can collect things like demographic information that helps us paint a picture of where they are and uh, the sort of heavy population or lack thereof that they might be in. Uh, we wanna take a look at uh, things like age tendencies. So again, if I'm looking at potential members how old are they? What impact does that have on their motivations? What sort of salary ranges do they have? Are they you know, tightening the purse strings or do they have a lot of money to spend? That makes an impact on how we market to them and it also makes an impact on how we make decisions to design things to attract them. So when we come up with these personas, they are the embodiment of something that we use throughout the design process. And a lot of times we'll use cute things like alliteration, like Michael Member. This is a person going through the process. And this helps everybody that participates in these exercises to say, oh, this is the person that I'm talking about. And we can take a look together at some examples. So this, these are examples that we have from the National Guard Association of the United States, and they were kind enough to let us use some of their examples. And these are a few per personas that we came up with. Now they have two different types of members, as you can see here, corporate members and individual members. We give them a name, but we also identify what sort of audience segment they are, as well as what relationship they would have to Nagus. As you can see here, we have a few different age ranges where they're located, their occupation, income, primary interest. And as we get further down the line, we also make note of their motivations and give them a bit of a story. So anytime I want to use these in an exercise, I can pull these up. And this is our common set, whether it's me, another designer, a developer, a marketing person, we can all take a look at these personas together and say, here's who we're talking about. They're representative. Now, these are not permanent. You can come back to these and modify these. As much as your business or your audience changes, you have a responsibility to come back and update these. But these are really the root of where you study what it is that you can impact in design. 
So how is that different from user stories? <laughs> so user stories are typically used in the agile development process. They're also helpful for user acceptance testing. And groups of user stories can be collected into what are called epics, these big things that we want to talk about somebody. Now, a user story can be as simple as called somebody to schedule a car appointment, or it could be bought my first car. Those are valid stories, simple as that. In some cases, we give them a format, sort of like as a blank, this type of person, I want to blank do something so that I can blank what is my outcome. That's the on the rails version of, of user stories. And we're typically, again, you'll see this as a theme, trying to answer questions when we do this exercise. So who are they? What are they doing? Why are they doing it? And how is that different specifically for them? Again, the in-state versus out-of-state tuition sort of model, the corporate versus individual member, those sort of things we want to tease out. So a few examples. Uh, I, again, I've worked with a few universities, so those are usually front of mind. So as a high school student, I want to apply for a student loan so that I can attend college. And as a parent, I want to apply for a student loan so that my child can attend college. Slightly different path and slightly different motivations for the two. And then as a professor, I want to write a course description so people can understand the course versus as a college student, I want to read a course description so that I can consider enrollment. Again, that's the training wheels version of it. If you really want to be full form, these are really powerful to understand who, what, and why. But we can be pretty simple. <laughs> so there are different exercises that we'll go through where it's more just verb noun pairs. This is really good for rapid group exercises, which brings us to user story mapping. So it's an exercise that allows us to collect a lot of those user stories. And you may have seen boards that kind of look like this with little post-it notes all over the place and you have groups of people. These physical exercises are actually really important because they get people engaged. You're all in your seats right now and it's morning and I'm sure you're kind of tired listening to my speech here. But if we were all up in a room together writing down, your energy levels go up and your creative brain really gets engaged. So this is a very powerful exercise to explore things. And you can go back to this and rearrange things and put things into an organized fashion. But this is also a very important tool to define things like a minimum viable product and things to help with agile development. What comes first? What are our priorities? What are we trying to accomplish? Sometimes you think you know what you're trying to build, but until you do exercises like this, you may have completely missed some very important things that the group can tease out. So what are user flows? How, how is that different than user stories and user personas and user journeys? Well, it does visually describe a process, so do user journeys. Uh, they can include a few different types. There are things called wire flows, page flows, decision trees. Some of this should be kind of familiar. I'm sure you've seen process flows in general. And they try to articulate a, a sequence that things are happening in. Now, user flows are really focused just on the process. They don't really focus so much on the people and what they're feeling. And that can be really good for a specification or trying to make adjustments or efficiencies. Whereas a user journey map, it can actually benefit from the flow. So typically you'll create just, okay, here's the process as we know it. And then that will feed into the user journey map. And it can also inform how to make adjustments to the user flow. So these are two different exercises that can inform each other. So again, questions that you want to ask when doing user flows is just understanding the process. So here's some examples that we put together for Nagus. Uh, here's an example just about becoming a new member. So up in the top left, we can navigate through the main navigation. We can go through the membership page to get to the join and renew. We have a bit of a decision. Am I an existing member or am I uh, a new member? And depending on that decision, I might go to a different flow like a renewal. Sometimes when we see these things, we'll, we'll, we'll paste it all out. We'll have these annotations down at the bottom to keep the diagram clean. And by putting this together, those notes will really help us understand where to make improvements. So just a few more examples, just event registration, writing to Congress, which is something very important to them, 
And we'll come back to this one in, in, in the user journey mapping as well. So these are user flows and we also have user, user journey maps that correspond to a lot of these user flows. Yes? Mm -hmm. Yes? Would you use that uh, user flows in the same kind of environment? Is, is there a time and a place for either? Yes, and, and they, all, of, all four of these things tend to work together. So the question is, would I use uh, when? users, when would I use user stories right. versus user flows and how do they work together? Right. Okay, just wanna make sure I understood the question. Yes. Uh, so user stories are really just getting very granular to the tiny things that you can do. Again, verb, noun, read a course description. Whereas a user flow is, that might be the goal, but how do I get there? So I might go through the main menu system, I might have to go through a course catalog, I, I might have four or five steps to get there. Should I have four or five steps? And it's okay, sometimes things take the steps that they take because it feels natural. But that's not my choice, that's not my opinion. That's something that needs to be studied. Does it make sense to the user? So that's why we use these tools to tease it out, but then we also circle back to test things with users. So we're we feeling lost. <laughs> Again, this is me just trying to say, ask questions, don't just assume. So all of these things that we've talked about so far, and we are getting to the user journey map in a second, um, are, are very similar and they do work together to partly answer your question. So user personas are very important to describe who this is. User stories are very important to say, here's this very granular task, and I can cluster tasks together in epics. User story mapping is a way to do that in, in an exercise. User flows are a visual way of describing things, decision trees, that type of thing, a process. And user journeys are what a person experiences throughout any part of their life. And you can then use user journey mapping to map that out as an exercise. So again, I, I wanted to make sure that we understood the terminology because it helps us understand where the value is of each of these things and why they're different. So let's get into the user journey mapping. So how do you create a user journey map? Well, I will always say start with a template. You don't need one template, but create a template because if you're gonna create several in sequence and you're going to articulate things to a client or to a team, or even show things to legitimate users, designers, whoever's participating in this, you want there to be some consistency so that gets out of the way. You're just focused on the product of the exercise. Uh, we want to include a user persona that relates to that journey, and we want to document the basic sequence of tasks. That's their process, what they go through. Uh, we want to divide up the different uh, segments and, and phases. As, as you may note, some of these really align with conversion funnels. So, for example, awareness and discovery. I just learned about Unleashed Technologies today. Interesting consideration. Hey, I, I have some work that I could do. Maybe that's, that's a company that I wanna work with. And then evaluation and conversion. I think that they're better than any other company. I'm gonna do work with them. So it's that process that we go through when making different decisions in our experience and things. That's how we want to try to evaluate things because we impact those things in different ways. And also your different channels, social media, conversations, emails, those come into play at different points. And that's the next point, <laughs> your touch points. If you go to a conference, that's a touch point. If you pick up the phone, that's a touch point. If you send an email, that's a touch point. Those are things that sometimes you have influence over and sometimes you just don't. And, that, and that's totally fine. Just understand where that is in the process. These can be devices too. These can be websites. You wanna really focus on the thoughts that a person has and the emotions that they have. And emotions are different than thoughts, just to be clear. What you feel isn't necessarily what you think. Huh, I'm kinda of curious about this. What am I gonna do? So we can graph that out. So let's, uh, again, come back to this and say how we can use this is to present findings to stakeholders, identify, define, redefine uh, conversion funnels, um, even present this stuff to users. Users should participate in your design process. Test it, validate your learning. Again, don't make assumptions that you haven't validated because that's a hypothesis that you aren't being held responsible for. 
There's a lot of money on the line sometimes. <laughs> and then create user flows to model those improvements. Again, you can go back and forth between journey maps and user flows. Uh, you want to ensure those touch points are optimized for conversion. So is there some sort of sticking point or friction point that we've encountered in our research? Is that something that we can evaluate with design and retest, see if we can work that out a little bit? And just because somebody has a negative emotion doesn't mean that's necessarily a bad thing. Sometimes that's the thing that promotes them to act. And we'll take a look at a good example of that in a second. At the very end, we have discussing ideas to populate the backlog. This, this is, again, that idea of agile development, this prioritization list of things that we could potentially do, build, change. Questions. We want to always ask questions along the way with every exercise and understand how we can answer them with users involved. So good examples of user journey maps, because that's the whole point of the presentation is to frame this out. Uh, we have a generic example that we can share that's, that's free for anybody to reference. We also have some examples that uh, Nagus gave us permission to use. So this first generic example, again, far left is the persona that this is for. So in this example, we're having a, a member of, of an organization try to attend an event. What is, what is his experience? So again, the persona frames out what sort of motivation they may have in attending a conference. In this case, you can see the, the three different phases, awareness, discovery, interest, consideration, evaluation, conversion. You can see the process each step that they take along the way. And yes, this process can fork at times. You can have multiple steps that fork out, but you wanna try to keep it as linear as possible because that's one journey. If it starts to fork too much, make a different journey map. It's okay if you have multiple journey maps. At the very top, you can see some of the thoughts that they're having at each touch point. So read conference brochure, they're thinking to this own, themselves, a coworker reminded me about the upcoming conference. At the next step, considering the conference, he's entering the consideration phase. I wanna attend this year's conference. Then my secretary reviews registration and travel options. Oh, I'm worried about expenses. I met with coworkers to discuss attendance. So you can see this thought pattern as they're going through this journey of theirs. At the very bottom, you can also see their emotional experience, excited about the conference. Planning is kind of a neutral, it's hit or miss depending on who you ask and then worried about expenses. These are valid feelings that a person has, but is there something that you can do to alleviate that? And as you can see here, there are different touch points, a discussion about the conference, a brochure, a physical thing that maybe you have control over in the marketing department. Maybe there's something on the website that informs them about the pricing or about the value of the conference, things that they can expect. They talk to their colleagues, you don't have any influence on that directly, but indirectly you do. So maybe the pricing is something that they're talking about. Well, did you have an opportunity before them? So this is a pretty standard sort of uh, uh, user journey. And there are a few other examples that we have here. These are the ones that we did for uh, Nagus. So this is just an individual member joining. We have pen potential, potential member, just as important as your existing member persona, a potential member persona is really important too. It's the attractor, if you will. So we go through the different steps, really think about the thoughts that they're having. You can see their emotional pattern as they go through here, like frustrated, searching for pricing, worried about expenses, happy to afford and benefit from the membership. So have you given good uh, messaging saying, maybe we give you discounts on insurance, maybe we give you discounts on, on education or on the conference if you're a member. These are important things and probably pretty familiar to some of you. Corporate member, for Nagus this is a, a different experience because it's not the same as an individual member. The touch points are a little bit different along the way here too. You can see the emotional experience is different. And we can come back to this after we go through the presentation if you wanted to talk about any of these slides. So I'm just gonna jump around a little bit. Uh, event registration, kind of similar to that first generic example, but there's a lot more detail. The person could have come in through a legislative news article or could have received an email notification about um, a membership renewal and as a byproduct also noticed a link to the conference. These are all valid paths that they can have. 
even after you have a conversion, this green star over here on the side, sometimes you also have additional steps that you are cognizant of in a process. Maybe this is the trailing thing that will lead to a loop where they reconsider going back through this funnel again. This one I really want to draw attention to. Uh, this was an opportunity, I think, for us to really understand that not all emotions need to be positive for people to do something. So here's an example of somebody writing to Congress. They went through this process, and you can see here towards the consideration side, they're thinking about uh, some, some legislation that they are very passionate about. And as a result of their passion for that, they're, they're a bit upset, and it's by being upset that they choose to act. So not all emotion, bad emotion, is necessarily something that you want to avoid. Sometimes it's an attractor for somebody to act. In the case of Nagus, they do have uh, different issues that they have, legislation that they track, and they offer these tools to write to Congress to try to promote people on their positions. And then also, it, here's a good example, the email newsletter sign up. So we took a look at what Nagus initially had, and when we did, we noticed that the consideration phase, there was no example of the newsletter. A, a very simple fix, so we just put a note in there saying, hey, this is something that we suggest doing in the design for the new website. So we did, and it helped. So that's user journey mapping in general, and we can circle back around to that, but I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about your own personal learning. Now, we all come from different roles, I'm very focused on user experience, design, information architecture, and technology, and that's, that's my path. And some of that you may share, and some of that may be uh, boring you to death. <laughs> but, but the point is, is that I, I, I like to draw attention to the learning process. There are a lot of different steps. You don't know about something, you encounter it just in passing, maybe it doesn't really stick. And then you become acquainted. Maybe it's starting to really stick, and it, it, it's a thought in your mind. You study, and after study, that doesn't mean that you're ready to do anything with it necessarily, depending on what it is, maybe becoming a chef, that sort of thing. But eventually, if it's something that you're truly interested in, you start practicing it. Through practice, you get experience. And eventually, if you do it long enough, depending on what it is, you become a master. I just started cooking like uh, about a year ago, which my wife absolutely loves. Now she's not the only cook. I do not consider myself a master. <laughs> so I consider myself slightly studied, a little experienced. But that's, that's the learning process, is all of these things that we learn, we have to know where we are in this. Sometimes we jump back and forth. So I actually created a little graph about that. And again, this is in slides and stuff if you want to share this. But I, I think the point that I'm making with this is early in the process, when we first start studying things, we feel like we know it. We feel like we're getting it. We, we read that book. It's really saturated. And if you walk away from that book, it's, why did you even read it? If you're not going to put these things into practice, they're not as valuable. So I think the, the thing that I'm trying to share with you, whether or not you personally do user journey mapping or any of these exercises, try to find ways that it can apply in your life. I'm about to do a home improvement. So me, I can sit down and do some some mapping out of what I need to do. So that way my anxiety goes down, I don't spend too much money. So all of this applies to growing, learning, becoming better at what it is that you can do in your professional and even your personal life. Uh, here's some suggestions that I would have. I'm very self-taught, but I would not be anywhere near where I am if it weren't for social events, having mentors, uh, participating in things like meetups, conferences, doing talks like this. I want to learn from you as much as you're trying to learn from me. Uh, there's uh, a few things in these slides. So if you want to learn more about these, these aren't my ideas. <laughs> I pull these from the community. So there are a lot of really good resources here for user personas, user stories, and user story mapping. I'm a big fan of the Nielsen Norman Group and Smashing Magazine, if you've ever seen these things. Uh, user flows, really good ways to engage that. And you'll see down here at the bottom, user journey maps or user flows, which one do I do first? That's where that inspiration really came from because I had that question. I, I didn't know which one should I do. The answer, by the way, was user flows. And then user journey mapping. There's a few good resources about this. You'll notice that there are different types of journey maps. What I laid out is not the only way to lay this out, but it's those base considerations. Where, I, where am I in the process? 
What is the process? What are people feeling? User flows are just the process. User journey maps are what are people feeling and how can I impact that? You'll see a lot that are also oriented for marketing, not just user experience. So thank you for everyone listening and, and participating. I, I certainly do want to take any sort of questions, but I'd be remiss if I didn't say, if you want to work with Unleashed Technologies or talk to us about some next steps, get some consulting on this type of work or web development or things of that nature, you can get in touch with us. Uh, here's the link to the slide, so if anybody wanted to take a quick snapshot. Uh, special thanks to AUSA for lending us this space and, uh, of course, for Nagus for their discovery materials. Mike. How do you how do you figure out how many um, personas you put together, and what do you usually see in terms of journeys related to personas, like volume-wise in the association market? Good question. So, how many personas and how many journeys would we have in the association market? Is that a good way to recap? Okay. Um, so, I think it depends on the size of what it is that you're trying to do and change. If it's a very simple change. If it's just a, hey, look, Chad, we, we don't want to do a full redesign. We don't want to completely redo all of our website. Maybe we just want to have this small initiative to improve membership signups. If that's the case, I would focus on the personas that relate to the different audience segments related to members, so potential members, maybe the different types of memberships that you have. And some organizations have a lot of different types of memberships. And as a result, their, their, their motivations may change. So that's the count of personas is really based on the, what it is that we're studying. And then the count of user journey maps that we may look at is really predicated on the processes that we're trying to improve. So I might not do a user journey map for the conference. I might not do it for the email newsletter sign up like we did with Nagus, if that would be our focus. So it's really the, the general question of what are we trying to improve. And then even after we do this work, Nothing has changed on the website, the brochures, anything that are those touch points that we talked about. In those cases, uh, it, we still have the obligation to figure out, okay, well, how do we go about doing that? Now that we've framed out the problem, understood the problem that it is that we can improve, what can we do to evolve the design, evolve the functionality of something, maybe even improve the navigation, different things like that. Um, it's something that informs that, that effort. So budgeting these things out, I would really lead with that. Also time frames. If we were trying to prepare for a conference in a few months, I, I would really want to understand like how soon does this need to be in place to have an impact. That's, that's one side of the answer. The other side of the answer would be, if you're trying to do a full website redesign, I would take an inventory of all of the critical functionality of that website. So typically when we start a new web initiative, if we're building a new website or migrating an existing website, we'll do an inventory of all of the business goals, the things that that website is responsible for contributing to. We'll do an inventory of the conversion funnels that it touches. We'll do an inventory of uh, critical paths. Uh, critical paths are different than conversion funnels in the sense that a conversion funnel the website can touch it, but then it moves over to other things. A critical path in a website is this functionality has to exist. On a membership site, this is, I need to be able to sign up. I need to be able to register for an event. If that didn't exist, the website is failing. It doesn't have the value proposition. So we'll take an inventory of these things, and then we'll ask ourselves the questions of, okay, what sort of things can we improve in this set of things? So I'm not sure the makeup of the room in terms of what everyone's roles here are, but this is more of a comment than a question. But you know, I think of these uh, user journeys and, and stories um, not just to my external customer or my constituent in the membership association, but also internally. Like, so for example, we're undergoing a, um, a major change in our association management software right now, and to me, the just as important to the front end experience of the end user is the sort of the for lack of a better term, of the back office experience for my internal users and getting my staff to buy in on, on what we're doing with this new association software. 
and and this applies to that as well. You know, it, it's it's about you know making those users happy, just and, and that a user experience a positive one, and not just our consi constituents. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thanks, Harry. Any other questions or concerns specific to your organizations, or more importantly, your users? <laughs> Okay, that's a good question. How did I build my persona data? Um, there are a couple different ways to approach that. Uh, demographics, analytics are a, a strong starting point just to understand what does the data show us. I'd be remiss if I didn't say that avoiding talking to people is a bad idea. Uh, you can't work in a vacuum. Um, in fact, making design decisions based on assumptions is, is dangerous. What if you're wrong? What is the penalty? What is the cost to your organization of being wrong? So we wanna assess that a little bit. So a lot of times with user personas, we will take a look uh, first at the general data. What does it show us who's coming onto our website? That's not our only touch point though. So it's important to have overlap in data. So analytics is one. User surveys are a really good resource. Making good strategic questions, again, figuring out the right questions to ask is, is a tricky one. Uh, but coming up with questions that you feel people will answer and sending it to the right audience will, I think, give you pretty decent uh, results. You wanna be sensitive to what they want to share and their time. So a simple user survey can be really good for things like customer satisfaction, basic information, but you don't wanna to pry too much and you don't wanna waste their time with a 50 question survey. Um, if you need big results, surveys or user testing, then you wanna incentivize that. And there are really good write-ups about how to incentivize participation. So this can be things like gift cards, discounts, those type of incentives. They're very important uh, to sh demonstrate respect for people's time. Uh, but really, the more you can talk directly with people, so user interviews, that type of thing, of course, you wanna have the things that you're trying to achieve out of it first. Like, what are you trying to improve in the thing that you're building? And then frame your questions related to what you know about your audience segment and what might motivate them. If you come armed with certain assumptions, try to ask things without being leading questions. But one of the most difficult thing in interacting with other people in kind of a, a research base is introducing bias. Am I asking a question that only lets them answer something in a direction that's you know confirmation bias or something like that? Um, but yeah, real interactivity, I would say, is the biggest thing that in influences user personas. Okay, so validating the user journey, like w would you use metrics or something like that? Um, there are a few different tools. Um, Google Analytics does have a few tools to analyze um, just conversion funnels in general, if it all stays on the website. That's sometimes the difficult thing is depending on the touch points, um, people go off of a website. Like, like the example I said earlier, my dad going to a dealership to buy a car. I, there are different ways to measure that, but there are ways that even that dealership doesn't have insight on. Um, but yes, you, you do take a look at that sort of data after you map this stuff to see whether or not those results make sense. And those maps are typically informed by that data. So they continue to refine to reflect reality as opposed to assumptions. And then you can make design decisions as they shape up. And we can assuredly say as a team, yes, this is what our research shows this conversion funnel looks like. And as you make refinements, improvements, if you will, uh, on paper at least, then that can inform the design decisions that you have. But uh, Google Analytics is one. Sometimes we'll use uh, heat mapping software, watching what people are doing. Uh, you can use eye tracking clinics and you can use uh, user testing, A-B testing to see whether or not the changes that you're making are truly impacting their emotions. Because they, again, any change is a hypothesis and we need to hold ourselves responsible to test those hypotheses. Does that answer your question? Any others? Yep. Sure. 
Sure. Um, so which department in an association would be responsible for constructing a persona, journey maps, these sort of things? Um, I would say there are a couple of departments that come into play. Um, I would not ignore any of them. If anybody touches users um, or, or say for example, your customer support department, your marketing department, your design department, your membership department, all of them have some sort of interactivity with users and each of their perspectives are slightly different. If we were to exclude them from the process, that is just at least gathering information, discovery if you will, um, then we may miss something important. So I think the, the, the risk of not involving people is very high. So at the very beginning of any project, especially with Unleashed Technologies um, in our discovery process, is we do a quick inventory of all of the key stakeholders, people that can be decision makers, people that can give us their subject matter experience. Because look, I, I don't know everything. Everybody collectively does. So we, we want to gather that information. Now doing the work, doing the research and putting it together internally within your organization that can be the responsibility of a few different par departments, again, too, depending on what you're trying to change or impact. So marketing departments will typically do this to try to have an impact on their marketing efforts. Uh, design departments, um, which may be related to marketing or it may be its own department, depending on your organization, may be more focused on what are we building? What are we visualizing in brand? and how are we trying to impact the emotion of people in those things that we're building to improve. Uh, it could also be your membership department who's really focused on improving the engagement outside of something like a website. Maybe this is something that's happening at a one-on-one -on -one talk. Maybe this is something that's happening at a conference. Maybe this is just simply, what are our member benefits that we want to gear specific to our audit? Maybe we thought giving a discount on insurance was a good idea, but nobody cares. And unless you do the research to validate that, then you might be making an assumption that is a risk or a waste. Yeah, I would just say like uh, 20 years of nonprofit association experience tells me it's probably different in every organization. You know, there's no blanket statement for that. For There's no blanket answer for your question, which is a really good one. Um, but I would just encourage just to the same points Chad's making is um, just give everyone the opportunity to have, you know, uh, a say in, in that in that process. Um, and, you know, the ones that will that'll engage with you are the ones that you'll gr get great feedback from. I was going to, oh, sorry, jump in with sort of a, a comment and a little bit of um, a little bit more on the idea of validating the journeys. But mm -hmm. in my past experience with building personas and journeys and, and process mapping, um, a lot of a lot of folks try to take shortcuts, and I've certainly been guilty of it myself. Where you, you know, you. S you interview a bunch of people, you get your personas together, and you're like, okay, so let's just put myself in this person's shoes and walk myself through the process, right? Mm -hmm. But unless you go back and actually test those assumptions, you're gonna you're gonna just sort of um, you're gonna miss some really critical pieces. Mm -hmm. So walking through it with the people that you made the personas with in the first place. Um, or some of the folks that you interviewed is really important to make sure that your journey does actually reflect their experience and, and you didn't just sort of drop a piece along the way. Yeah. 
Um, I think what you're touching on is, is something that some of you may have heard of. It's a, a principle in Agile and uh, things like the Lean Startup is this idea of getting into a cycle. Um, it's the, as they call it in Lean Startup, the build, measure, learn cycle. Now, at any point, you can break out of that cycle because maybe you started um, a small application, you have you know your early adopters, and now you need to shift to a mainstream audience, and well, the behavior of your application just has to be different. And this is true of anything that you may participate in. Uh, the idea behind these sort of exercises, these activities, is to learn. And after we learn, we need to validate that learning by measuring. Um, so that's the question. How am I measuring if this is true? And there, there's a lot of answers to that. So there's no one formula for that. Um, in, in some cases, that's KPIs. In other cases, that's just other metrics that we can have. Sometimes it's just observations like A-B testing or heat tracking. It just really depends on what it is that we're studying. Um, so I think that it's important uh, for all of us to hold ourselves responsible for, even though we learn and come up with a hypothesis, that validation is important, and then we need to act. That's that build side of things. And after we build it, now it's different. Now we need to relearn and remeasure and keep looping around. Sure, sure. Um, I, I mean, again, the, the, this part of the reason why I used the example, so the question was, oh, what other business reasons outside of associations would you use this for? Is that correct? Um, what other business would you use for that? Like, 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 I see, I see. So the, let me just reframe for the sake of recording. Um, what other business reasons aside from a website redesign would a, an association have for doing this sort of work? Is that, okay. Um, a, a, again, I think your, your business has more than just a website property. So that's why we talk about the idea of touch points. So I think the simple example is marketing is, is a very obvious example. So maybe you have marketing brochures. So what is the cohesive experience between marketing brochures, the sales process, the conference, all of these different places that people interact with your organization? So I, that's part of the reason why I say um, at the very beginning of a relationship, I wanna talk about your business needs from a high level. What are your KPIs? How does your business thrive? What are your revenue streams? What is it that makes up success for you? And then what are your user needs? Why, are they why would they even want to interact with you? And just understand that. So take a look at things like the conversion funnels, which the website doesn't even need to touch, um, and see what sort of things that you have influence over. Maybe you want to run print ads. Maybe you want to partner with another organization. How does that process actually look? So I think all of those are opportunities to make improvements that can have a direct impact on the success of a business. From from the sales side, I can tell you that what we mainly see is um, we're engaged for two reasons: is uh, outside of the website, meaning you're not doing a brand new build. Is one of the major reasons is you built a brand new website, but you don't know if it's doing what you thought it would do. Yeah, that's one of the big ones. The next one is um, decline in different areas, so membership, events, different things. So, uh, people start looking at things, or it, on the flip side of that, uh, incredible success, because they don't know why. So you're trying to figure out why people are all of a sudden resonating with you or not resonating with you. Um, one of the things that Chad mentioned earlier that I feel like is being a little glanced over, but is very important, is key performance indicators. Traditionally in the association market, and there's still a lot of people that operate this way, and it's hard to get to it. It's very difficult. but. Um, we set up very trackable metrics for what defines success in an existing website mm -hmm. and or in uh, a new build. And then we track against those user personas, journeys, and all the processes he talks to help inform the, hi uh, the hypothesis. So hypothesis, you, hypothesis, you know what I'm going for there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> hypotheses, yes. Yes, it, it helps inform that. So if you have that in there, you, you have a better chance of hitting and not missing. 
So we're brought in typically, or people start this process when they feel like they don't understand their membership as well as they thought that they did or how people interact with their assets. This is a very hard process for associations that traditionally don't have a strong web presence. Back to your point, and they have one, maybe they just rebuilt it, but they just sort of like, yeah, we did it. But they don't know what they did or what they accomplished or why it was valuable. Um, especially with the changing landscape for all the associations with that digital footprint being so important. I think that's where you see the most of it is um, we, we get brought in to either audit or to build fresh, and those are the two things that we have. Uh, you'd be surprised how many people don't have this. So if you don't have this, you're not alone. You know, there's, there's a lot of people that don't understand their segments. Yeah, I, I, I like to use that analogy. Not, you're not building a building when you're building a website. You're building a garden and you have a responsibility to water the garden, to feed the garden, to figure out what it should produce. And I've tried gardening, I kill plants. <laughs> my, my wife, she's an amazing gardener. Um, and despite her best effort, efforts, she may have aphids attack her tomatoes and well, she doesn't produce what she expected. And I think the key performance indicators are, well, if you have a garden or a farm and you're trying to feed people, you have a certain yield that you're trying to pursue. If you have too much, well, you're going to be giving away a lot of food or wasting. Um, and in, in the analogy compared to a website, I think it's important because it, it implies a responsibility to growth and adapting to change. Your people change. We're all human. Your business changes. And I think it's important to have that responsibility very early and identify the objectives that you have. So uh, as Mike said, key performance indicators are something that we'll track very early in the process. And it helps us frame this. It helps give us direction. So one thing that we do at Unleashed Technologies is we have this um, idea of the growth model. So when you work with us, we identify the key things that we can do together, but we use the KPIs to try to frame out the things that we feel collectively are the most impactful to your organization. You want something to be flashy on the website? Well, the question I'll ask is, well, what impact does that have on your users and your KPIs? And if we don't know how to answer that, I'd say, well, is that more important than this thing? And we try to reprioritize based on that. We're all held responsible by the same thing. It also helps as kind of like a proverbial campfire that we gather around. Without those sort of measurements that we're really trying to focus on, there are tons of metrics we can track. There are also things called vanity metrics, like page views and stuff. Does that, uh, look, unless I'm getting paid for people hitting my page every single time, then that's, that's a bit more of a vanity metric. But if I ask a developer, a designer, a marketing person, what makes this website succeed? I'm probably gonna get three different answers. But if we all work together on com coming up with those answers, then we all know what they are. So that's, that's usually why we try to frame that out. And I would just add that you know it can apply to basically any. Chad keeps using the term touch point. I, I like to say engagement, but um, you know essentially anytime you're interacting with a potential customer. I mean, you think about it in event planning, for example. I mean, if you're you're setting up a queue in terms of your registration for on-site, you know, registration, you can think about a user journey there or um, social as well. I mean, it's it's online, but if if you're doing um, any online advertising or social interactions um, on like a LinkedIn or Instagram or something like that, you know, and, and thinking about those advertisements, uh, th those posts, those promoted posts that you might put up, think about the journey from there and where it's going to get them um, in terms of their story. 
as well as your email marketing campaigns. I mean, I think it applies, you know, across the board, not just, you know, when thinking of websites. Yep. Thanks, sir. All right. Anybody want to talk about any sort of challenges that you're personally facing? Any difficult sort of, oh, I don't understand the user, users at all, or my business just is not growing in these areas. Do you have any sort of cases like that that we might be able to help with? Yep. I'm curious, when you think about the design of a like process versus a user interface, mm -hmm. is there a difference between the user product and building experience or tech cabinet? Mm -hmm. I mean, as I was interpreting the same process, if one person is just happy to be more tech savvy, so they can get process five, and the other person just wants to be using it. Sure. Okay. So I, I think, gen yeah, it makes it makes a lot of sense. Um, so it's the breadth versus depth problem. Uh, so I guess the general question is, what are we focusing on? Are, are we trying to get into the minutia? And you're, you're going to hear this answer from me a lot. It depends. <laughs> it depends on what we're trying to accomplish, I think. Because anything needs time and budget uh, to, to really dig into things. So we, we really want to focus on what the exercise is. I think from a general perspective, it is a, a really important thing to identify the high-level audience segments. And any audience segments you encounter will have sub-segments. So it's the idea of you know, a potential college student versus diving down and saying in-state versus out-of-state. And you can keep diving down. So is out-of-state in the United States or in another country? That experience continues to be different. So um, it's the 80-20 rule get 80% of the way there by doing 20% of the effort. Um, so if you focus on that, it, the broad audience first, that really helps you understand what will capture most needs. But you are right. If you're having a very specific issue in an interface, especially when it comes to customer feedback, so one of the things that we do in our early intake uh, discovery meetings when we're trying to understand users is we don't even come up with personas yet. We're just listening. We're just observing. So we'll ask people, okay, what do you hear from your customers? What sort of emails are you getting? What sort of calls are you getting? Because that lets us understand where the pain points are, the friction points are, the opportunities for improvement. So if you're doing a redesign of a, a website from scratch, or if you're, you're just trying to improve something small about an existing website, the, the approach still remains the same. What are you trying to improve? So if we just push aside all the other people that can participate in uh, a university website for a moment, and we know that we're trying to improve th that process of prospecting new students, that sort of thing. Well, let's load it up, see what people are experiencing, load up some heat mapping and study it a little bit, try to wrap some data around this and say, okay, well, we see them go through the process of applying for a student loan. Good God, this application, ask them like 50 questions, has five pages, why, why is it that long? Does it have to be that, is there a legal reason? So you push through some of those pain points that you can absolutely study, you can map where, where they're experiencing that pain. You can also method act. You can go through the system yourself and see, is this feedback actually valid? Are, they, are, are there technical reasons why this is happening? So maybe in, in Chrome, it works great, but they load it up in Internet Explorer and the page is just white. Why is it loading up weird? This, so there's, there's some simple testing things that you can do pretty early without even knowing about the user to validate these sort of pain points. But beyond that, if it all tests out well, then digging into actual people, talking to representatives of the, those segments can really help tease out those issues. So I think that's a, a fantastic question. And I actually have a, a very recent real world example. And, and I'm, I'm actually curious about what Chad would say about this, especially because he had a very big part in designing our website and, and, and going through this. So, <laughs> okay, so the, here's the example, and it's very simple. I've had some of my marketing folks come to me recently and say, um, I'm, members are complaining about accessing their member benefits, okay? Generally speaking, they're just trying to access like savings to, you know, coupons and those sorts of things, okay? My opinion, our website is very clear how you access your member benefits. 
Uh, first of all, all you have to do is search AUSA member benefits. It's the first result you'll get. You know, it's like so to me. It's like how could it be hard to find? But and and it's all over our homepage, for example. But people, the feedback I'm getting is the that the users can't find it. They're looking for it on the menu, mm -hmm. right? So you know, it's something I struggle with, right? Because I, I, from my perspective, I guess you know I'm I'm technical savvy, and so for me, it's like just search AUSA member benefits. That's the answer. But that's not the answer to everybody. And you know, I struggle with what the right solution is because I don't want to like you know make my my homepage you know member benefits up front. I want it to be news and current and something. So you know, that's a little bit of a struggle. I think it's similar, sort of similar to what your question was. You get my brain going. I love this. Um, so Don Norman, he he's the one of the principals at Nielsen Norman Group wrote a really amazing book called The Design of Everyday Things. It's a long book, but it's fundamental to design. He talks about affordances, this idea that there's something that is being offered to you, something that can happen. An affordance in a car is it can go. <laughs> uh, then you have indicators, something that says this is possible. And do you know for the first time when you get into a car what it can do? Unless somebody's shown you, probably you don't necessarily know what the pedals are. That that might be what they call a mapping problem. So, when you talk about a user or a human interfacing with something, uh, one of my favorite quotes from uh, Don Norman is: "There, there, there is no bad users. There's only bad design." So when we hear pain points like this, it really is a design problem. So that's where empathy comes in hand. So I'm, I'm too close to the issue. I'm not gonna understand it. I need to talk to the people or who are having this problem and try to understand it. So in psychology, we have these things called mental models, this preconceived notion of the world. When I walk into a store, I expect a checkout to be you know, towards the front. If it weren't there, I would be disoriented. <laughs> I wouldn't know, where am I gonna go pay for this stuff? Maybe there's some sort of app or something new. That's a mapping problem. And, and that's something that we need to remedy. And that's okay in design. Sometimes we have groundbreaking new things. When tablets came out, you had human beings transitioning from you know, paper to this new digital thing. So they had to have some sort of a transition to allow them to effectively use these devices. So that's why in design, you have these indicators of what it is you can do. Apple's solution to that, they came up with a note app that looked like a legal pad for the longest time. It's because that's the mental model that we had when it came to using that device moving from paper to digital. So in the case of a person having difficulty finding member benefits, something so fundamental that, that you would expect, you go to an association site, that you've made it obvious. What, what problems typically come up, I'm not gonna say this is the solution, but things to explore in, in that thing is, are they experiencing things like decision fatigue? Um, are they experiencing an issue where their content model is not being fulfilled, where they expect it in one place and it's not in that place? So just that, that's a question is test them, have them go through and just observe. We don't judge when we observe people, we just study them. So just have them go through on the phone, record it and have several people go through it and, and see what their expectations were. And when you hear that ping, Oh, I was expecting it here, and, and just don't even sit, don't tell them where it is. Just have them struggle. It's uncomfortable, <laughs> but you have to push through those things to figure out what their actual expectations are. Um, when I say decision fatigue, us as, uh, as as human beings, if we're exposed to too many choices, it's what I call diner menu syndrome. <laughs> then we take forever and. Uh, how many people have been at a diner uh, and looked at the menu and you're just taking forever trying to make a decision versus you go to some eclectic restaurant that has five choices. You make a decision probably in a minute. The, the point is, is that there, there's a certain mental load that we have when presented with choices. There's also breadth and depth problems. But from a general perspective, when a human being is presented just with a set of choices, there's, you may have heard of this, uh, something called Miller's Law. It's the magic rule seven, plus or minus two, so five to nine. If you have 20 choices that you're proposing to uh, a person to navigate something, 
that's too much. It will take them longer to make a decision. If that's the only thing that they can be presented with, then so be it. But if you can, divide and conquer. Try to group these things together and then let them drill down. So that way they can make more effective choices. So I, I, don't, I don't know um, where it's buried in the menu. I don't know if there are other choices surrounding it that might be distracting them from making an effective choice, but that's where I would probably start, listening to them and also analyzing where you're currently starting at. I mean, I mean the real answer is that it, it, when we went through the process of you know ranking the priority of, of what's important to a user on our website in terms of the masses, you know, the, the, the member benefits were not one of the top priorities, honestly. Mm -hmm. And so you know, it was about keeping fresh content first and mm -hmm. then getting new members second and then getting event registrations third. So that's really the answer. I mean, obviously I'm not gonna say that to my marketing folks, but <laughs> I mean, that, that, that's <laughs> the truth. Yeah, I, I think what we experience um, when we're working really closely in an organization, I think we all experience this, is, is we are too close to the problem. We have different competing agendas um, and what we fail to do is have sensitiv sensitivity to the person coming to the website. The thing I like to remind people is, uh, well, a couple things. You don't go to BGE to look at web pages. I certainly don't. I go there to report an out outage or pay a bill. That is a human activity. And if it weren't for the website, I'd find a different way to do it. So it's, it's really important to understand the human problems that these tools are trying to solve before creating the tool or improving the tool. And again, there are a lot of exercises. These are not the only exercises, but these are good tools to be able to understand those sort of problems. Um, information architecture is uh, another area where I like to spend a lot of time, is what is it that a person can do in terms of uh, navigating your website, using search? How is information classified? Are there good effective labels? Is this their terminology or is it your terminology? And if, if you don't know the answer to that, those are opportunities to make adjustments. I could talk about this stuff for hours. <laughs> Any other questions? All righty. Well, thank you all very much.